Welcome to the end of series special. Coming up, I check out the ZX Touch. I watch some old demos. I test the Quasar. I look at the games board and much, much more. See you in the next series. You will be familiar with the atrocious attempt to make a handheld Spectrum and the subsequent theft of backers' money, so anyone else looking to produce something similar would always have an uphill battle. Someone though has done just that, but this time they did it the right way, without asking for backers or funding, without misleading people, and without causing rifts in the community. That someone was Elmar Electronics, and the device is the ZX Touch. Previously, they had produced the ZX VGA, which I reviewed in episode 128. The first I knew of this device was at Crash Live 2023, where I saw a stack of boxes and demo units. They were already made, already packaged and ready for sale. Moving on a few months, and after making contact with the offer of allowing them to use some of my games in the firmware, they kindly sent me a unit to test. This was not a payment for a review, or even payment for the games I offered. This was just a free unit in appreciation of me allowing them to use some of my games. They didn't even ask for a review, but I'm going to do one anyway. It comes in a well-built and attractive box, with the front showing the unit and the name of the device. The unit itself looks very impressive and is well-built. The buttons and joystick are robust, and the design is both aesthetically pleasing and good to hold. It weighs just over 520 grams, which may seem a bit heavy for a handheld device. The unit has several connections, a micro SD slot, a USB socket for charging, a headphone socket, and a power switch. On the left hand side is a mini joystick, under which there are four buttons that can be used as a D-pad or just as buttons. On the right there are four more buttons, and these again can be configured. Below those is the speaker. The 7 inch touchscreen takes up most of the device's space. Pressing the power on button and it takes about 4 seconds to get to the menu screen. And here you will see the list of built in games, all nicely displayed. You can scroll through them using the touch screen, and a later firmware update, which we'll get onto soon, also allows navigation via the joystick and buttons. The built in games are the more modern ones, so you'll find things like Gummy Medieval Defender, Sword of Ayana, Cray 5, Buzzsaw, and more. You can, of course, add your own games which we'll come to later on. The menu screen has many things to explore though. Bottom left and bottom right are soft buttons, and initially I thought these were not required, but upon playing several older games, these are the most common used keys to start and configure the game before beginning, which turned out to be very useful. For example, when starting Attic Attack, you first have to select a joystick or keyboard, you then have to pick a character, and you then have to select a zero to start playing the game, so these buttons work very well. You can also configure them yourself if needed. There's a virtual keyboard that pops up if you need it, so if you feel inclined you can play adventure games, or use text input for other things. Because this is a touch screen, this works much better than trying to navigate with a joystick. There's a speaker button which mutes the speaker, simple enough. And above that the settings button, let's dive into this then. There are a lot of things in the settings to be set, obviously. The screen settings allow you to switch on and off things like scan lines, brightness, display size and ULA plus options. In the sound section you can adjust the sound, including the mixing of beeper and AY levels. The physical keys section allows you to map any key of the Spectrum's keyboard to any of the physical keys on the front of the unit. This is very useful and easy to use, and I'll use this later on when playing Attic Attack. The side keys section allows you to change the virtual keys on screen, bottom left and bottom right, so they're not fixed. The joystick settings allow you to configure the mini joystick, and here you've got an option of using all directions, which tries to simulate an analog joystick, or not, which simulates a digital joystick. Whichever you choose is really down to your own personal preference. You can also select the sensitivity of either. In case you didn't notice, the unit has LEDs around the outside edge. Nice, but could be annoying if you're in a dark place. Then again, playing a Spectrum game in a dark place with other people could be a bit strange anyway. Here though, you can adjust the colours or turn them off. 
One nice feature that I'll be putting to use later on is that you can simulate the border effects using the LED, so whatever the border colour of the game will be, the LEDs will display that. The miscellaneous section allows you to select different ROMs to use if you want, and whether to auto-load games. You can also see the firmware version, mine is 1.09, and I'll be upgrading this later on. The save game option allows you to save games that you're playing and continue later. On the right hand side is a folder button which takes you back to the front screen. There's a reset button that, well, resets, and a pause button to pause the game. Because the unit comes with 9 tiles ROM, to avoid any copyright problems, the first thing I'm going to do is swap in the original Sinclair ROMs. You can get these ROM files from most emulators, and there should be three of them, one for the 48K and two for the 128K machines. You place the ROM files, as outlined in the manual, in the ROMs folder on the SD card. Named correctly, go to the miscellaneous settings and set the option to use other ROMs. And that's it. Back to the main screen, load any game and reset, and you should have the Sinclair logo. Right then, let's play a game. How about Genesis? A cracking shooter, this. Yes, that seems to work well. Okay, let's try a different style of game, King's Valley. Initially I found it tricky to control the up and down movements with the mini joystick. It was set to analog though, so I changed it to digital, in other words I turned off all directions, which basically makes it the old fashioned style joystick you used to get. This seemed to make it better. Obviously this varies on the game being played. As you can see, the screen looks excellent. It runs at 50Hz, the exact speed of the spectrum, and looks very crisp. It has a resolution of 1024x600, which is ample. It can be a bit reflective though, especially if there's a bright light source nearby like a window or light, but it does look very clear and bright. The sound is also good, as you can hear. I didn't hear any problems with any of the games that I tested. Both AY from 128K games and the beeper all sounded fine. Let's try Cray 5 then. A really nice sounding game this. The control was okay once you got used to it, but I was never a fan of joysticks anyway. I much preferred keys. The next thing you'll probably want to do is put your own games on here. And there's a multitude of options around this. First thing you'll need is a micro SD card. The simplest way is just to copy the game files to the SD card in either tap SNA or TRD format. If you want to use the TRD files, you'll also need to copy the TRD ROM onto the card. You can use subfolders if you want to as well. Once you've got some games on the card, you put the card in the ZX Touch and power on. On the home screen, top left, you'll be an option to view the SD card. And here you'll see a list of files the ZX Touch can load. Make sure you pick the correct machine for the game though. As I wondered why Attic Attack kept failing, but then again I realised it was set to 128k. Now you can simply play the game as normal. If you want to reassign some keys, for example Attic Attack uses the Z key to pick up the door keys, you have to go into settings, into physical keys, select which key you want to change, and then select the key from the keyboard it will represent. I picked the right hand side cluster of buttons and the far right button. Back to the game then, and now I can use the physical button to pick up the game keys. Now on to the clever stuff. Although you can pick games this way, it doesn't look very attractive, but you can make your own dashboards and build game files so they look just like the ones on the home screen. To do this, you will first need firmware version 1.10. Download this and put it onto the SD card. You then turn on the device while holding down all eight buttons, which isn't easy. The upgrade should happen automatically. If not, just select the firmware file and a few minutes later, it will be complete. Version 1.10 also allows Z80 files to be used, 
There are also a few other minor tweaks and changes like border rendering and floating bus optimizations. Right, let's add a new dashboard in a new game. Go to the home screen, touch and hold and a pop-up will appear with an option to create a new dashboard. You now have an empty dashboard and this can be accessed using the left and right buttons on screen or left and right buttons on the joystick or D-pad. It's a bit empty though. Let's add Attic Attack. Before you can do this, you will need to convert the TAP or SNA file to a ZTG file. Luckily, there's such a tool built into the touch. Here's a tip. If you are going to do this, before you convert any games, make sure all the settings you need are in place already. Things like key mappings, sound options and ROM versions because these will be saved along with the game, so you don't have to keep changing them every time you load it up. With the settings ready, locate the game on the SD card, touch and hold. A pop-up will appear with a progress bar. Keep holding until it's complete, and another menu will appear. Select Add to Library. Games need adding to the library before they can be added to the dashboard. Now here you get a chance to do things like choose an image to display. This can be from the game file or video memory, which is usually the loading screen but the best option is to use a JPEG that you've created yourself because it looks much better. All the details about this are in the manual. You can add the information section about the game as well. And again, this is another JPEG file. And again, it's all in the manual about how to do this. And the last thing is to add the game title. Now back to the dashboard, touch and hold and select add game. You can now add your newly created ZTG file, and there it is, looking very nice. I think this is a great idea for those that want the device to look fantastic. It's not mandatory, and you can use the file listing if you want, but having this option does make a difference. Someone has thought about this and implemented it well. It would be nice to be able to do this via an online tool, or even a downloadable app onto your computer, and it would certainly speed things up. Now with more games on my dashboard, let's try some older titles. First one of the games I use to test such things, Aquaplane. This will test the timings and split border effect. Despite the firmware mentioning the border fix, I can still see a misalignment sadly. Maybe I have missed something in the settings, but this is running in 48k mode with the Sinclair ROMs. Now onto Manic Miner then, well, just because. And yes, that worked perfectly. And obviously Jetpack. Now I can't really play Jetpack with a joystick, but once set up, it works fine. On to B squared then. nice AY music and yes that plays fine as well and this is an AGD game so no problems at all. How about something a little more challenging? Let's say Castlevania. Yes all looks good, the screen is crisp, the sound is great and it all works perfectly. Overall, I'm finding it difficult to find anything negative to say about this device. The screen looks great, the dashboards look really nice, and the ability to add your own games is a well thought out option. I would hope other file types will be added in the future, mainly DSK files, so you can play plus three games. Another idea would be to add AY sound for games in 48k mode, and for a bit of fun, how about some sort of cursor mouse light gun option to allow users to draw on paint packages or use light gun games or mouse games. But that's getting into a niche market really. But it would be nice. The price is quite high, but you do get an excellent well-made and well-supported handheld spectrum. The firmware is being continually updated and any feedback will be taken on board. I really like this, and to be honest, I was about to buy one, but they were out of stock for UK delivery at the time, which prompted my initial email. If you were let down previously by other failed attempts, then this is a no-risk purchase.
they are real, you can buy them, instead of gambling on getting one, and you can even visit retro shows where I'm sure they will be there ready to be snapped up. The demo scene for the Spectrum, like all demo scenes for all systems, started off with simple visuals and sound. Many just gathering various AY tunes together and adding a nice front end. Some took things a little further, so I thought I would explore some early examples of Spectrum demos. Obviously, current demos are far superior, so don't judge these too harshly. Here's an example of a multi-part demo, Nine Ties by the DVB. First a countdown to 1990, followed by the fireworks from Penetrator with sound, then goodbye 1989 and on to 1990. The main part has scroll text, a moving logo, laser effects, and of course, music. Okay, so nothing special by today's standards, but still nice to look at. Moving on, and the first of many sample music demos. Yes, it's hard on the ears. I won't show any more of these. Next, the Atari demo. Smooth scrolling top part of the screen and the number keys trigger different tunes. And the follow-up Atari 2. Something tells me the people behind this just don't like Atari users. Now I want something different. The wait was worth it. Next we get a little story about the destruction of the Earth. Simple animation, but nice nonetheless. And next, a long demo with plenty of animation. Blood Jack. It's pretty impressive stuff. Many of the concepts here are common to demos on many other systems, and it was interesting for me to see early examples of this on the Spectrum. Things like parallax scrolling, bobs, copper effects, and nice logos. The things we consider normal.
I like looking back through older demos as well as more modern ones. It gives me a sense of where things came from and when. And there are some good ones to check out. Sinclair Interface 2, Sir Clive's failed attempt to bring cartridge games to the Spectrum. It was too little too late, and the cost of the cartridges were too high, plus the limit of 16k games only didn't really help things. There were a few clones which I have previously covered, like the Kempston Pro interface, and of course the Ram Turbo interface. There are also modern recreations, one of which I covered in episode 138. Another one is this, the Quasar. This nice looking board provides you with a ROM cartridge slot plus a reset button. Like the other one I reviewed, it has no joystick port. Now the reset button on the previous Interface 2 clones for me were superfluous, especially considering its intended use, which is of playing the ROM cartridges released for it. You can't swap the ROM cartridges in and out without turning the power off, so why have a reset button? Unless of course you wanted to reset a game, or the game has crashed, which is unlikely. A reset button on the modern recreations is probably more suited to the numerous multi-game ROM cartridges now available. But as we saw in episode 138, this does not always work as planned. The interface works like the original, as you would expect. You power off the spectrum, plug in the interface, slot in the game of your choice, power on and off you go. Great for single games. But what about those multi-game carts I mentioned, that weren't available in 1983? But today, there are many such cartridges available, in some cases not all officially licensed, and now the 16k limit has been removed, so any 48 game can, or should, work from a cartridge. Let's take a look at a few of these multi-game cartridges then. Any one of my patrons would have seen my video on items purchased from a seller site that is not eBay. I'm trying not to say the name without actually saying the name, but it's impossible. Anyway, all of the cartridges that are available from Etsy, oops, there you go, I've said it, are not official, and they probably don't have permission of the copyright holders. Here is one such collection, the DKtronics collection. It doesn't contain all of the DKtronics games, just a selection of 20. It comes on double ROM cartridges, and the box and packaging are, to be honest, very good although I'm not sure having mind on the front cover is the best thing. The games included are shown on the back, and listed on screen. Because modern recreations of Interface 2 uses standard parts, sometimes you have to file down these multi-game cartridges, which I've had to do previously. Once plugged in and the spectrum turned on and we get a functional menu, you can choose the game and play it straight away. It works just fine. As seen in episode 138 though, some multi-game carts are not happy working with clones, or interfaces with reset buttons to be more precise. Here for example is the Ram Turbo. It loads the first game off the DKtronics cartridge, but when you press the reset button it just crashes, and you have to power off anyway. The Quasar acts in the same way. Pressing the reset button just crashes the whole thing, and you have to power off. Which brings me back to my earlier point of why have a reset button in the first place. Just to check things out, I set up my Spectrum Plus and used the reset button on that rather than the interface, and got the same result. So let's have a look at some of the games on the DKtronics cart then. This collection is not official, and I'm not endorsing it in any way. I'm just showing you that multi-game cartridges are available. Let's have a go with Maziacs then. A great game this, a conversion of the ZX81 game Mazogs by the same author. You move around the maze, ask prisoners for direction, keep your strength up by eating food, and fight Mazogs, er, I mean Maziacs, although it's best to try and avoid them. I don't think it holds the charm of Mazogs, but it's certainly a great game. The maze is random each time, 
So the challenge is always there. And there's always a Mazog, oh, done it again. I mean, Maziac just around the corner. And you find yourself making mental notes of where the food and swords are located. Nice fight sequences too. Yep, I enjoyed playing this. On to another multi-game cart then, and this one I did buy from eBay. The build quality is very good. This one contains all of the official Sinclair ROMs, plus a few more games. Like the DK Tronics cartridges, once you boot the Spectrum up, you get a menu, a nicer looking one too, where you can pick a game and just start playing. The reset button on this one just loads the game again, and doesn't crash the system which I suppose is a good thing, but it's a pity it doesn't go back to the menu. As well as the Sinclair ROMs on here, like Horace, Space Raiders, Jetpack, etc., you get a few other titles thrown in. These, on my version, are Arcadia, Galaxian, Manic Miner, Mr. Wong's Loopy Laundry, and Phoenix. Some other cartridges on eBay have different games. As you can see, there's a 48k game on here too, Manic Miner. And this one has options when you load it. You can change the language and add pokes. That's a nice touch, actually. So you can start the game with infinite lives or collision detection turned off for certain things. There are many pre-built multi-game cartridges around if you choose to buy one. If you want to build your own, though, there's this, the ZXC4, which I covered in episode 109. This cartridge lets you add your own games via a PC and Interface 1, so you can create your own compilations. With this in the Quasar, you just boot up, and you see a menu, pick the game, and off you go. The obvious difference here is that you can put games of your choice on. Now, interestingly, if you press Reset, with this cartridge in, it goes back to the menu, which is how it should be, really. This means that you can swap games without having to turn the power off. Maybe this is because it's not really a ROM cartridge as we know it. It's an EEPROM cartridge. It has a programmable EEPROM in there, along with circuitry and other things to handle that. And now onto another multi-game cartridge, and a very rare one given to me as a gift from a viewer of the show, Harvey Lodder. I'm sorry, Harvey, it's taken so long to mention this. It's a brilliant package, and it's official, not a cartridge full of unlicensed games. This is one of three ever made, and contains a few things. The first is the original version of Quest for the Golden Egg Cup by Network Version Games. Then there's the enhanced version from Mastertronic. Then the publisher demo. And finally, an unpublished, unendorsed and unofficial game based on the world of Automata. The quest for the Golden Egg Cup is an adventure game. You start off in heaven, and you can find a few items there like a golden egg, a clipboard and a tablet if God happens to drop it for you. Soon you'll come to a beanstalk, and if you can work out how, you can climb down to the real world. Well, nearly real anyway. You know how adventure games work. This is the Mastertronic version, with added graphics and extended text. The game has humour similar to the Fergus McNeil games and obviously a nod to Automata. I suppose these clone cards and multi-game cartridges are a bit of a niche market. Most users would opt for a Div IDE or something similar. But these allow the use of original hardware and or cartridges, and it's a bit of fun at the end of the day. From Quasar to Quasar, this is Quasar released by Rose Software in 1983. Test your quick thinking as well as your quick reflexes in one of the four quizzes combined with a fast action machine code maze, so the inlay states. This is a quiz game, and one it seems I'm not very good at. Because this is a 16k title, I was not expecting too much, which is a good job really. Let's have a go then. Oh dear, this just looks like basic to me, but yes, there is a 2k of machine code somewhere. You are given a question, and are then given three choices of the answer. When you decide which one is correct, you have to guide your man in character squares to the correct number relating to the answer. 
And you have to do this before the thing that chases you, which is a bow and arrow, lines up either vertically or horizontally with you, in which case you get shot. It's a multi-choice quiz, but some of the questions are a bit over the top. Luckily I didn't get them whilst filming. You get an annoying beep more or less all of the time, which is very distracting when you're trying to work out how many marbles someone has left in their hand if their friend gave them five but lost seven and they had 47 to begin with. Ugh. When the answers appear, you can sit back and work out the answer, there's no set time limit. But as soon as you move, you need to have planned a route carefully so that the bow and arrow never gets a chance to shoot you. I'm not sure what this game is for really, other than testing your general knowledge, and it's probably aimed at the educational sector. I wrote something similar, way back in the 80s I think, but it was more about Spectrum games than anything else. Breaking into the game, and yes you can see the basic listings and the questions. One to forget then really, unless you're making questions for a quiz yourself, and need some ideas. The Spectrum's Dead Flesh keyboard was not liked by some people. Personally, I think it was fantastic, especially coming from the ZX81. The only other option to improve it was to buy, at roughly half the price of a Spectrum, a full-sized keyboard like the DKtronics or Transform. These provided a vast improvement for anyone typing letters or writing games or even playing text adventures. There was another, cheaper option though, if you wanted to just play games. There were a few around, and they all looked like they did the same thing. They provided a plastic cover over the top of the Spectrum's keyboard, and added plastic keys to control the keys of the game you were playing. Here is the games board, produced by Marvic Marketing, around 1984. Are you being zapped by finger drift? asks the advert, and goes on to list the features, including instant attach and detach, mask unwanted keys, and improve scores by 50%. Now I'm not sure how that could be proved. Here's mine, with a box just like the advert. Inside we get a large plastic cover, designed to fit over the 16 or 48k rubber key model. On the top are holes for the keys. You place the keys in the holes over the keys you use for the game. Quite a simple idea. It's supplied with 10 keys and stickers that you can use for directions and fire and that sort of thing. And that's it, and now we are ready to improve your scores. In operation, well it's simple, you clip it over the top of the Spectrum, and it's a nice tight fit around the Spectrum, no chance of this falling off. You then put the plastic keys in the holes that correspond to the keys underneath. With the cover clipped in, the plastic keys rise slightly above the plastic outer casing, which makes them feel a lot better. So in this case, if we're going to play Attic Attack, we need left, right, up and down across the Q, W, E and R keys. And we place the fire key on the T key. The pickup, something that always has me stabbing randomly about, will go on the Z key, or even the symbol shift. Yeah, yes, I think that's better. This is a game I have always wanted to complete, without maps or pokes. So I'll keep practicing. Ah, I need the start key. Okay, so let's put another one in place. Here we go, just pops in there. The keys feel slightly better than the rubber keys, to be honest. And it does help only being able to access the keys for the game and no other keys, as the advert says. And yes, it avoids finger drift. Obviously with only 10 keys, it may limit the games you can play. Games with a lot of keys, like Lords of Midnight for example, wouldn't really work unless you made your own keys out of bits of wood. For arcade style games though, it works fairly well, and for just £9.99 it's a cheap option, with the emphasis on cheap. It only gives you a slightly better feel to the keys when playing games, and I suppose it was a bit of a gimmick.
This is Yudao, from Inafutu, released in 2023. We've seen a few quality games from this person, and this game is no different. It looks and plays like an early arcade title. At first it was tricky to work out what you had to do, but it soon became clear. You move around the screen and have to guide the red car over the flags. To do this you press space and then move in the direction you want the car to go. As you move away, a direction tile will be dropped. If the car hits this, it will change direction. leaving a trail of direction cards, with the aim of removing all the flags. If the car hits you, or the other ghost-like character collides with you, you lose a life. The car can also crash into the rocks, and also when it hits the blue blocks, the blocks vanish, and your car can fall off the edge of the screen if you're not careful. The graphics are simple 80s style and work really well. There's a tune that plays throughout and the game is very addictive. Just like those early arcade games. A nice idea, well implemented. Certainly give this one a try. Spectrum isn't particularly well known for its musical capabilities, with the exception of Mr. Beep and a handful of game tunes. Okay, okay, I know people love the sound that the Spectrums can produce, but I'm talking about vast soundscapes and orchestral pieces, things like Alistair Brimble can produce. I'm hoping most of you have heard of Alistair, he's been programming music for games for decades, and has created the music for such iconic games as Alien Breed on the Amiga, and a lot of other Team 17 titles like Super Frog, Project X and Assassin. He's also done things on other systems, including the NES and Commodore 64. He's also produced many albums, some of his game music, others like Tick Tick Boom, a conceptual album that I own and bought back when it was released in 1996. Amongst his albums though is this one named The Spectrum Works. Here he takes well-known music from various Spectrum games and gives them a dusting with some brimble magic. Tracks like Glider Rider, Agent X and Platoon. They're all reworked into orchestral pieces that are brilliant to listen to. At a very modest price of £7 you can download the full album, along with many others based on his work with machines like the Amiga and PC. I've got this one in my car and will be listening to it quite a lot. Well, that about wraps it up for this series. See you soon.